Good morning. Uh, we have a midterm coming up. We've got midterm one uh, coming up pretty quickly here. Um, so we have been through um, chapters 21 through 26. Uh, we've looked at electric fields, electric forces. Uh, we've looked at some circuits, some DC circuits. And uh, so those are the topics that are represented on the midterm that's upcoming. So here are some practice problems. Now, um, these are good problems to look at. I'm going to go through those today. Uh, we've got two sets of these. This is, uh, this is one set of problems that showed up on a midterm, midterm one, from a previous semester. This was from several years ago. Uh, this particular set of problems showed up. And then I've got a, a second set of those. So I think for the first part of class today, we'll take a look at the first set, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and look at the second set. And uh, as we said, they're going to be looking at electric forces, electric fields, electric uh, energy, electric potential, and then we've got some circuits. So here's the electric field stuff, the electric force stuff, um, and then the circuits uh, in the other problems. Let's take a look at a couple of these and see. Now, again, these are... Uh, these are really good problems to look at. Uh, they're very representative of the kind of topics that we've been studying. Um, but again, these four problems by themselves don't represent everything that we've looked at. As you guys know, um, we've gone through a lot of stuff. And so uh, make sure that in addition to these problems, uh, that you're looking at the homework problems and going back over the lecture and looking at sample problems there. So make sure that you're hitting all the topics. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So in problem one, it says that we have three objects. Each of these objects is charged, and uh, they all have the very same charge. So it, assuming these are positive charges, I think we can do that in the problem. So let's say that this is 200 microcoulombs. Each one of these objects contains that much charge. And they're forming this triangle. It's equilateral. And each side of the triangle is 10 centimeters. So uh, a fair amount of symmetry in the problem in that all of the objects have the same charge. And then the distances between the charges are all going to be the same. So what it asks us, let's read the problem carefully too before we jump into uh, trying to solve this. What is it they're specifically asking for? Now, we've looked at the electric force, how much force would be produced in this situation on the objects. They're going to uh, have uh, forces. Uh, in this case, the forces will be repulsive because each of the objects is positive. So we, we can set up the forces. That's one possibility. They could also be asking about electric fields. Now, electric fields have a little different feel to them. And so uh, we'll take a look at that. They could be asking about electric potential and electric potential energy. Now, when I read the problem, in the details here, it says calculate the force, calculate the field. Now, when they ask about the field, they've got to give us a location. And the field that they're asking for is right at the center of the three charges. So again, there's a lot of symmetry in the way the problem is set up. Um, calculate the electric potential and the total. Oh, so they're, they're asking about all of it. So that's, that's why this is a midterm problem, right? It's asking about force and field and potential and potential energy. It's asking about the big four. So let's get this thing set up. I guess we want to start with electric force. So I've drawn a force diagram. Now, each of the charges individually is going to be experiencing two forces. And that's because it's got a couple of neighbors that are charged. And so uh, how large will these, charge, these forces be? Uh, so I set this up. They're all positively charged. So the forces between the charges are going to be repulsive. There's going to be a set of repulsive forces between charge 1 and charge 3 between charge 1 and charge 2, and charge 2 and charge 3. So I've got three interactions taking place, three sets of forces that I have to go in and, and take into account. Um, let's see. So what I can do is, and what we've been doing in, in lecture uh, up until now, and in the homework problems, what I can do is I can separate this out into 
what are the directions of the forces being applied, and then how much force? What's the magnitude of those forces? So I'm going to start by saying, you know, the magnitude of the force um, acting between charges 1 and charge 3 is going to match the magnitude between 1 and 2 is going to match them. I'm just going to call it F. So I've dropped the vector signs, and I'm saying the amount of force will be given by K times Q times Q divided by distance squared. So that's our general formula for calculating forces between two point charges. Um, and since all of the charges are the same, this, will, this number that we calculate will apply for each of the interactions. So I put in the values for Q. Now remember, there's a lot of prefix stuff going on here. The micros are 10 to the minus 6. So make sure that you're uh, keeping track of um, you know, micros or milla or um, pico or femto. Uh, in this case, it's micro 10 to the minus 6. This works out to be 2 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. And then the distances also, I want to get those in standard units. So the easiest approach is likely to uh, put everything in standard units and work from those. Now, the force constant, remember there is this electric uh, force constant, little k, uh, that they've introduced. I'm going to work from this formula that was first introduced and then put in the 8.99, that's an 8, 8.99, 10 to the 9th, Newton's meter squared over Coulomb squared. That's going to get multiplied by charge. It's going to get multiplied by charge here. That's two factors of Coulomb. Cancels the Coulombs in the denominator in little k. And then in the uh, denominator of the uh, formula, that's going to be 0 0.10 meters. That's going to get squared. So uh, the units all cancel out except for the Newtons. And carrying out the numerical calculation, it says that that's a pretty large force. So uh, almost 36,000 newtons of force. Now, how did that happen? Well, this is a, actually a fair amount of charge. So when we've got um, a couple hundred microcoulombs, that's a, you know, it's a reasonably large amount of charge, and they're placed pretty close to each other. You know, 10 centimeters is a distance like this, you know. And so uh, it's a reasonably large amount of charge placed reasonably close. And so we're getting this enormous force. You would not be able to hold these objects so that they would be this close to each other. That's thousands and thousands and thousands of newtons. So, uh, in any case, you know, I did the numbers, I went back, I double-checked, uh, this is the number that I got. I, by the way, if you guys catch any errors in any of uh, the examples here today, or in any of the lectures, uh, let me know right away. Um, I really appreciate that, because then I can uh, get those corrected and let other students know that, um, you know, some of the numbers may have been miscalculated in some of these. Uh, anyway, I'm getting these 36,000 newtons. Now, let's take one object at a time. Uh, the directional information is right here. What it says is that the forces on 1 and 3 are going to be exactly opposite. They're going to repel, and they're going to repel so that they're being pushed directly away from each other. Um, and so that is going to be, well, at a 30 or 60 degree angle, depending on how we define this. Um, because it's an equilateral triangle. So here is the diagram I drew for object number one. So here is object number one. It's going to experience a force along this direction, right there, due to the presence of charge three. And it's going to experience a force in that direction due to the presence of charge two. So I'm always taking pairs of charges to calculate the force and determine the orientation of the force. Um, so that's 30 degrees and that's 30 degrees. Now, if I set up a force diagram like this, these forces that are angled, they're going to have x components and y components, let's say. 
So the x components are going to cancel out because it's the same amount of force angled in the same direction. The horizontal components, those are going to cancel out. But in the positive y direction, those forces are going to combine. We're going to get those two forces adding together. And that's going to give us our net force because the x components cancel. We know that the net force will be directly in the y direction. That's going to be uh, F cosine theta and then another F cosine theta. That's going to be two F cosine thetas. So I put in the two, I put in the F, put in the cosine of 30. It turned out to be 62 kilonewtons, 62,000 newtons. So this is a pretty large force, a very, very large force, that we have acting on these individual charges. Now, when I move on from charge, so we, we've, we've determined that force one, uh, object one, will experience a net force directly in the y direction. When we move on to, to charge two, we can say, well, everything that we calculated applies to charge two, or object two, except that the direction now is going to be somewhere e e equally uh, spaced between F2, 3, and F1, 2. It's going to be down in that direction. And so that, oh, I should have drawn all of these in, huh? So that force is going to be away from the center. So the center is right here. And the force on Q2 is going to be angled 30 degrees below the, ho the horizontal. And um, it's going to be the same 62,000 newtons. Um, and then object 3 also, uh, the net force here would be off in this direction. So everybody's got the same amount of force. Each of the three objects will experience the same amount of force. And for each of them, the direction will be away from the center. All right, questions on that? Let me know. If you guys have any questions on any of that, let's move on to part B. So part A was looking at forces, and those are vectors, and that meant in addition to calculating amounts, I had to calculate, I had to determine direction. So I need a force diagram for that. What about the electric field? So the electric field um, is not the same thing as calculating the force. It's very different. Uh, so don't get those two mixed up. Um, and what's happening here is that um, we're picking a location in space. So I'm going to pick a point right there and ask, what's the effect of having charge 1 and charge 2 and charge 3 on that location in space? What we're doing is, what we've talked about in lecture is when we're calculating an electric field, we're kind of anticipating that maybe another charge comes by. What would happen if another charge were to come by and uh, be placed right at that center location? What would the effect in terms of forces, what would the force acting on that be? Now, looking at that problem, you're probably, I hope you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, all the forces will cancel out because of the symmetric placement of the charges. So what would happen for the electric field is in terms of an electric field at that point, we have to take into account a contribution from charge 1. Charge 1 is positively charged, and that says its electric field at that location would be directed in the negative y direction. So that's the placement for electric field due to charge 1 at the center. Now, the magnitude of the field would be given by k times q divided by r squared. But we don't necessarily need to calculate that, and that's because there's enough symmetry in the problem that when we combine the effect of the electric field due to the presence of charge 1, and then due to the presence of charge 2, and due to the presence of charge 3, our vector diagram tells us that 3 vectors uh, angled equally, 120 degrees between each of them, in um, different directions with the same magnitude, those are going to add up to be zero. So we've seen some examples of this, I think in lecture, I, I know there's some in the homework, uh, 
So watch for that. Uh, and that this is a good example for this practice uh, set of midterm problems because um, yeah, these kind of problems do show up on the midterm. So forces, uh, in this case the field ca uh, canceled out to zero. Didn't have to uh, if the charges did not all balance or if the location we were looking at was not at the center of this system. The E fields would not have uh, canceled out. But in this case, uh, the vector addition, uh, these are going to cancel out. Moving on to part C, if we calculate the electric potential. Now, if you remember, the electric potential is a, a scalar. And the midterm's coming up, so I'm sure you remember that the electric potential is a scalar quantity. So it's not a vector. Uh, we don't have to uh, keep track of directions. Now, we still want to use a diagram. Uh, and so the diagram for part C is going to look something like this. Here is the presence of charge 1. Charge, did I switch 2 and 3? I really did. I, I don't think it's going to make any difference, right? 2 and 3 can be switched. They're the same amount of charge. So I got 1, 2, and 3 charges. Um, what, we, what we know uh, from, from chapter 23, I guess it is, from chapter 23, um, what we know is that um, the electric potential is going to depend on how much charge is here and how far we are away. So what we can do for, that, for this is just say that the electric potential at the very center location is going to be a contribution due to the presence of charge 1, presence of charge 2, presence of charge 3. Now, I've also got to find distances, so I had to do a little trigonometry or whatever here. Um, what I did was, um, well, the angles here are going to be 30 degrees. Um, said that the cosine of the angle was equal to 1 half L divided by R. So I'm just using the definition of a cosine right here. That's uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side would be 1 half of L. And the hypotenuse would be, um, would be R. So that's the definition of the cosine. I solved that for R. I put in the 30 degrees, I put in the 0.1. It says that the distance R is um, 5.77 centimeters, or 0 0.0577 meters. And then I, I'm, I'm going to stop and see if that makes sense. So, um, and I think it does, because this length here was 10 centimeters, right? So R is going to be, it's going to be bigger than 5. It's going to be bigger than uh, half of L, but not by much. And so, yeah, 0 0.0577 meters, that seems pretty reasonable. Now, I didn't quite get this problem all fit onto page, uh, one page here. So I'm going to move on to the uh, next diagram here. Uh, we still have the same set of problems written here, so we can keep referring back. Uh, so for part C, what we're going to do is we're going to add all those together. Now, the uh, electric potential due to each one of the charges is given by KQ over R. Since there are three of those, I just put in a factor of three. Now, that only works because all the charges are the same and all the distances are the same. And so I was able to, again, because of the symmetry, uh, basically solve for one of those and then multiply by three. And since it's a scalar, it's not a vector quantity, it doesn't depend on direction, it's just an amount. And so what this is saying is, again, if I took a charge and I brought it into that location, how much, this is, this is related to how much potential energy that other charge would have if it were placed at the center location. So calculating the electric potential says that um, in terms of energy, that point is, it's not zero energy. The force is canceled out, but the energy isn't going to cancel out. If I had another positive charge and I brought it to that location, that would require work. That would require an input of energy to take a positive charge and bring it in and place it at that location. And that's what the electric potential is telling us. Hey, there's positive charges here. If you bring another positive charge into this region, 
you're going to have to push on that charge. You're going to have to do work to bring it closer to these other positive charges. If it were a negative charge, then it would get drawn in, right? And so, uh, but potential uh, gives us that all of that starting information um, about um, due to the presence of all of these charges, uh, what effect is that having at the center in terms of electric potential, energy per charge? Uh, and that worked out to be 93 million volts. So that's a really, really large potential energy, right? We saw how large the forces are um, between the charges. If we were to bring another charge in um, of comparable charge, uh, it would be a lot of uh, energy required to do that. So finally in part D, they're asking about not how much energy is there if we bring an additional charge in, but just the three charges themselves. So part D is saying, hey, calculate the total potential energy of the, of the um, <clears throat> system of objects shown in this example. And so um, what, we, what we've said in class is that what I can do is I can write down the uh, electric potential energy formula uh, for the interaction between, char oh look, two and three moved back again. Uh, charge one and two, there's a certain amount of energy required to bring these two guys closer to each other. There's a certain amount of energy required to bring these two charges this close. And there's a certain amount of energy required to bring these charges. So when I take these three charges, it doesn't matter which order I move the charges around in. If I start with these three charges far away from each other, and then I one by one I bring them into this configuration, at the end of the day, at the bottom line here, is that I'm going to have three interactions going on. Uh, for each of these interactions, the um, potential energy is given by K, Q1, Q2, all the Qs here are the same, divided by the distance between them. So I plug those numbers in. Again, little k is getting used in every one of these problems, right? So that little k shows up everywhere. Forces, fields, potential energy, uh, electric potential. And it says that uh, the system, constructing this system, required 10,800 joules. 10.8 kilojoules of energy uh, was required of, in terms of work, for example, in order to push these charges together uh, into that configuration. Okay. And so the amount of energy required to push those charges together and form this configuration, that's the potential energy of the system. If we let go, these charges would fly away from each other, and uh, this potential energy could be converted back into kinetic energy, for example. Any questions on that? So I like problem one. I have to say that it's it's very it's it's thorough. It's looking at everything kind of from chapters 21, 22, and 23. And chapter 21 had a lot of stuff in it, in particular. So a lot of stuff in uh, chapters uh, 21 and 23, also. Uh, and chapter 22 is is no slouch. So um, anyway. Let's move on and take a look at another one of the problems here. So um, I'm moving on from problem one, moving on to problem two. Now this is, um, I can see what's going on here is we have an object. It's got a mass M. I could have written that in. Uh, it's 20 grams and it has a charge. So this has a positive charge on it. And it's, uh, it's uh, coming in at some velocity. And it's coming in... Ooh, this is the initial velocity. That needs to have V-naught on it also. So V-naught is 40 meters per second. So it's coming in at 40 meters per second, and then it's going to enter a region where there's an electric field. Now, at 40 meters per second, 40 meters per second, that's like, you know, 100 miles at 90 miles an hour or something like that, we've said. Um, so it's coming in really fast. In problems like this, we tend to ignore gravitational effects unless the problem specifies. So I'm not going to worry about gravitational effects here. Uh, I'm just going to look at the force that uh, 
that happens as a result of the presence of the electric field. And the electric field itself is here because there's a bunch of positive charges on this plate, there's a bunch of negative charges on this plate. So um, this positive charge comes into this region and begins to experience uh, a force. Now what they're asking us to solve for is, hmm, they don't ask about the force, they ask about the acceleration. But we know those are related. So they're first of all asking about uh, magnitude and direction of the acceleration. And then they're going to ask what is the direction that the velocity is in once this object exits the region. So let's think about that. The object's going to come in here. It's going to start experiencing a force in the positive y direction. Now the x velocity, it looks like it should stay constant. You know, it starts out with an x velocity of 40 meters per second, and that sounds like it's going to persist. Um, so here is this object coming in, 40 meters per second, but it's going to start picking up speed in the y direction. And so we're expecting it gets deflected up, oh, something like this, right? So um, the picture that we're guessing that's going to happen is something like this one. Here is the initial velocity coming in. It retains its velocity in the x direction, but it begins to acquire a velocity in the y direction. All right, let's go back and get the acceleration stuff and work through. Here is the first picture. There's the electric field. The electric field, I'm writing down all the given information. I'm getting myself organized here. 9,000 newtons per coulomb, 40 meters per second. And then I've converted to standard units here, 0 0.10 meters. Now, the acceleration of this object is going to be given by the force divided by its mass. How much force is it experiencing? And what's its mass? That's going to determine the acceleration. Now the force, the electric force, acting on a charge, uh, an object with charge Q. Oh, I didn't write down Q. Q's over, oh, it's big Q. I switched to little Q. So uh, this is little Q instead of big Q. And it's uh, 17 millicoulombs, so I did get it listed here, uh, times the electric field. This object is going to experience 153 newtons, and that direction of the force is going to be in the positive y direction. So I've added that to the diagram right here. It's going to experience a force in this direction. Initially, it's traveling here. Uh, the force is 153 newtons. If I divide that now by the mass, did I get that correctly copied? I think I did. Um, so the mass needs to be converted into kilograms. That's giving me an acceleration of 7,650 meters per second squared. And that's why we're neglecting gravity. Uh, in, in most of these examples where we're looking at accelerations due to electric fields, the problem has been set up so that the acceleration due to the electric field uh, is much, much larger than an acceleration effect due to gravity. So the gravitational force on this object would be really, really small, uh, a fraction of a newton, and uh, so this force dominates. Uh, and so we're going to get the acceleration, and uh, the direction is in the positive y direction. So that's it. That's the acceleration we'll have. Uh, so it says that it's going to start picking up speed in the positive y direction, and that's going to happen pretty quickly. Uh, because of how large the acceleration is. So I've drawn this curved path, and then once it exits the region where the electric field is, I'm going to say it goes back into straight line motion. So straight line motion as it approaches, during the time that it's in the electric field region, it's going to have a curved path, and then once it exits, it goes back into straight line motion. So as we've talked about a couple times now, we've mentioned in the x direction, there's no force. So the x velocity, as it exits, just matches the v naught. That's going to be 40 meters per second. But it's going to pick up a velocity in the y direction. And I calculate that by taking a couple different ways. I could calculate that by taking a, the acceleration times time. For that, I'm going to need to know how much time it was in that region. Now, I can calculate the time in the region 
by taking the x distance and dividing by the x velocity. So that's an important step here because um, we don't have anything in the y direction that will tell us how long it was in that region. So I've got to use the x information, the distance and the velocity, to determine that it was in that region not very long. Uh, the region was only 10 centimeters in length, very short, and um, so it was in the region only for 2.5 milliseconds, 2.5 thousandths of a second. Now if I multiply the acceleration times that time, it tells me that that's enough time, given this acceleration, that the object is going to pick up a y component of velocity of 19.1 meters per second. And um, <clears throat> now I've got my x velocity, and uh, which, you know, I just had to realize conceptually that vx is not changing. And then I also had to know how to calculate um, velocities in the y direction for the constant acceleration. Uh, I can combine those two components and say that the, uh, the total velocity, the, the, the velocity of this object, is 44.3 meters per second. To get the direction, I have to give some kind of directional information because that's what it asked for. Um, I'm going to come back to my diagram and say the velocity is it's angled. There's a, an x component and a y component, and plugging those in, I got an angle of 25.5 degrees. So that's going to that's going to come as a result of determining the uh, the tangent of that angle. All right, questions on that? I like that problem too. So I do feel like, um, you know, we've looked at different traje trajectories in electric field regions, and, um, you know, that's, uh, we've looked at examples in class, uh, homework problems. Uh, that's something you want to take a look at, is what does happen to a charged particle placed in an electric field, what will the accelerations be, how much force is there, uh, what will its kinematics look like. All right, any questions, stop by, let me know. Let's move on to problem three. Uh, problem three now, we've, we've taken a look at electric forces, electric fields, electric potential energy. We've looked at kinematics using electric forces. Now let's look at some circuit stuff. So this is chapters 24, 25, and 26. And uh, this is straight out of chapter 24, I guess. It's looking at capacitors. Now, I have to be careful here. I have to pick out the battery. This is the battery, 12.0 volts. Uh, and then I've got three capacitors. Now, what it says is how much charge will end up on each of the capacitors, what will be the voltage, uh, and how much energy is stored. So this is kind of a standard uh, problem dealing with a system of capacitors in a circuit. So let's take a look at it. Now, I've redrawn this. So I, I, I did this a fair amount. Uh, what I did is I put the battery over by itself, and then I ran some wires over. And what I can see from here is that if I look at this diagram, uh, the 4 nanofarad battery has both of its plates connected directly to the battery. So that um, capacitor is what we call directly across the uh, terminals of the battery. And so that's what I've done here, as I've placed it. So I'm calling the 4 nanofarad capacitor, capacitor 1. Now, if I look at these junction points, what I can see is, again, these junction points represent directly connect, direct connection to the battery. But this time, the path between that contains two capacitors. So the first thing to do is, and is, is to... Um, you know, play around with changing the, the pictures. We've talked about this too in class. Um, that draw, often, it's a good idea to redraw the circuit uh, in, a, in a manner where it's, it's very easy, that you can see very readily um, how these capacitors or resistors are arranged. And so I've redrawn this. I've written down all the information. I hope I got it all correct. Um, and so what we can do is we can say, well, for this capacitor, that's not, that's not that difficult in terms of voltage. It's 12 volts because it's directly connected to those 12-volt terminals on the battery. 
Now, <coughs> capacitors two and three are going to be sharing the 12 volts. If I put my voltmeter here and here, you know, I connect the voltmeter here and here, it's going to read 12 volts. But if I put my voltmeter directly across either one of those capacitors, so how much of that 12 volts is here, and how much of the 12 volts is here? And they will be additive. They're directly in series with each other. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take those two capacitors, 2 and 3, we're going to combine them into one. So we're going to use the rules that we've uh, derived for determining the capacitor, the equivalent capacitance, of two capacitors that are in series with each other. And so for that, what we derived was that we add together inverses. So 1 over C2, 3 is equal to 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. Uh, and 1 over C2 would be 1 over 12. 1 over C3 would be 1 over 6 nanofarads. Now, I've got to carry this out in my calculator. What I ended up with, with C, for C23 is 4 nanofarads. So, the overall equivalent capacitance here is 4 nanofarads. Now, um, sometimes students think, oh, it's an easy calculation. I don't have to worry about it. But make sure you're practicing this with your calculator. Because calculations like this start to involve order of operation. I've got to divide, and I've got to add, and I've got to do it in the right sequence. So I've got to make sure that, and different calculators are set up differently. Some calculators are set up so that they have a bunch of parentheses, and you can, you know, make sure the order of operation is correct using a bunch of parentheses. Others, you have to do part of the problem at once, and then maybe write the number down. And, uh, and then do another part of the calculation and write that down. Um, Anyway, check and make sure that you're able to carry out that formula. Doesn't, it doesn't look too difficult, but it causes a lot of problems. Um, so anyway, 4 nanofarads here. Um, and then what we can do is we can say that when we charge these capacitors, C2 and C3, they're going to end up with the same amount of charge uh, because they're being combined in series. They start out both being not charged, and then they both charge together. And so for that, <clears throat> um, what we can do is say that the charge on capacitor 2 and the charge on capacitor 3 are going to be given by the same number. I'm going to call that Q23. And uh, that can be calculated by taking C23 and multiplying by V23. Now, V23 we know because that's the full 12 volts. V2 by itself and V3 by itself, we didn't know. But uh, that's why we went in and calculated that equivalent capacitance, is so that we could do this calculation of charge individually for capacitor 2 and capacitor 3. So what we've determined is how much charge is on capacitor 2 and capacitor 3. Once we get the charge individually on these capacitors, we can determine the voltages by going back and taking the charge on capacitor 2, dividing it through by the capacitance. Same thing for capacitor 3, we take its charge, divide through by its capacitance. So it turns out that the voltage divides up as 4 volts over capacitor 2, and 8 volts, yes, that's another 8, uh, over capacitor 3. Okay, so we got all the voltages figured out. Now, if you remember, once, once you get all of the voltages figured out, uh, usually the rest of the problem is just plug-ins. And so once we've got all the voltages in place, we can come back and say each of the charges then would just be the capacitance for that capacitor times the voltage across. Now the voltage on one was 12 volts, voltage on two was four, and the voltage on three was eight. I gotta make sure I'm getting all those in correctly. Now, uh, charge 1 actually is the only one we haven't already calculated, but that's 48 nanocoulombs. It does happen that um, charge 2 and 3 uh, and 1 all have the same value. That's just by coincidence. That's just because uh, the, six, the weight of the 6 and the 12 combined uh, to give 4 nanofarads. So in general, that's not going to happen. Don't count on that happening in a problem. 
And then the energy stored in a capacitor is one half the charge times the voltage. And so plugging those numbers in, I got 96, and this took a couple tries it looks like. I got 96 nanojoules and um, 192 nanojoules for, uh-oh. <laughs> I never wrote down the energy on, on uh, capacitor 3. I've got to go back and add, I'll go back and add that in. Sorry about that. Uh, ooh, I'm going to lose points on that. Okay, how would I calculate the energy stored in capacitor 3? It's going to be 1 half Q3 V3. Ooh, how does that vary? So V3 is twice as much. Um, so that's going to be twice the voltage. I'm guessing it's going to be twice as much. I think this is going to be 384 uh, nanojoules. I think. So check me on that, but I think that last one's going to be 384. Hmm. Oh, I hope I don't lose too many points on that. All right, let's take a look at this last example. Any questions on this, stop by. We'll get that looked at. Let's look at this last example. It says that we've got um, capacitors and resistors, and we've got a switch in here. We're going to close the switch. Now, the only circuits that we've looked at that involve resistors and capacitors pretty much is uh, are what we call RC circuits. So let's take a look and see. Um, so the capacitors start out uncharged and then what's going to happen is, oh there is, there's a time constant. So there's a time constant for charging these capacitors. Um, how much time is required to reach one half of their full charge and then we got to calculate some currents. Okay, so it's a bunch of stuff from looking at RC circuits. And we said RC circuits are kind of interesting because uh, things are changing, right? What's happening is that the capacitors are going to start off with no charge at all, but then they are going to exponentially approach this asymptotic value. So at first they're charging really rapidly, and then they slow down, and they kind of settle in to this certain amount of charge on the capacitors. Um, and then the currents, meanwhile, when we first close the switch, because the capacitors are not initially charged, the circuit just operates like the capacitors aren't there, right? Initially, for that first instant. And then, once the capacitors start to charge, uh, that is going to affect the current. And so the current's going to start off at this high value, and then it's going to exponentially approach zero. The way that circuit is built, and not every circuit is the same, right? There's going to be real variations depending. If we had put <clears throat> another resistor right here, for example, then the circuit would continue to operate. The capacitors would charge, but the circuit would continue to operate even as the capacitors were charged, current would continue to flow. Um, for this circuit, and again I've redrawn it, uh, here is the voltage, they say 20 volts in the uh, battery, and then I've got a couple of resistors, and what we can show is that the resistors are in series. So resistor, resistor, and then there is a section where the two capacitors are in parallel with each other. And so what we can do is we can do some combinations. The resistors combine to give uh, Okay, R1 is not equal to R2. I've got to get this changed too. Oh my gosh. Okay, R1 is 30 ohms. R2 is 20 ohms. Uh, when they combine, fortunately, when they combine, they are 50 ohms. Um, but only when they combine do they become 50 ohms. They're not 50 ohms individually. Got to get that corrected. Um, and then C1 and C2 are 40 and 60 microfarads. They are in parallel. So with the capacitors that are in parallel with each other, we can just add the capacitances together. And so the capacitances will add together. Uh, 40 and 60, that's going to give us 100 microfarads. So we've got a combined 50 ohms of resistance and a combined 100 microfarads. The time constant for this circuit, R times C, 
we've been able to take this circuit and show that it's the equivalent of a circuit that has a battery, one resistor, and one capacitor all in series. That's the requirement for the RC circuits that we've looked at. So uh, our one capacitor is at 100 uh, microfarads. Our one resistor is at 50 ohms. That still worries me that I, I corrected it, and it's, it's, it's still not correct. Um, and so I, but I can combine these, and so this works out to be 5 milliseconds, or t 5 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So we've seen this. Uh, where we have these capacitors that charge pretty rapidly. Uh, and so when we draw the graph, remember at one time constant, we are at 63% of that final charge. Uh, and at two time constants, we are at 84%, and three time constants is 95. So here's the formula for the charge. Now what they're interested in is how much, let me see if I've read this right, how much time is required for the charges to reach one half of the of capacitors to reach one half of the final charge? So one half would be less than one time constant, right? One time constant would put us at 63 uh, percent. If you if you're not if you don't remember this, go back and, and take a look at those uh, the lectures on that, the class where we discuss these exponential functions, but. Uh, so the one half is going to be in here somewhere. What I can do is I can take this expression and say I want this in stuff in the parentheses to equal one half. And the way that's going to happen is if e to the minus t over tau is one half. So I've isolated this one part and set that equal to one half. Now when the charge is at half of the full charge of the final asymptotic value, the current will have dropped to one half of the starting currents. These two plots are related because they have the same time constant. Currents are dropping, charges are increasing, but they're kind of flipped over, they're kind of, yeah, flipped over versions of each other. Not mirror images, but depending on how you think of that. But they're kind of flipped over to where this is asymptotically approaching a final a finite amount of charge, and this is exponentially approaching an asymptote of zero. All right, so uh, to have that equal one half, I did a natural logarithm on both sides and got this, and then I solved for t. I flipped the one half to remove the minus sign here, so that becomes the ln of two, and this works out to be 3.47 milliseconds. Now. Remember, we said it needs to be less than 5, and that seems about right. So it's not much, much less, but it's, it's less than uh, a time constant. Now, in part C, they said, uh, what would be the currents in the resistors when we first close uh, the circuit? Now here's the formula telling us how the currents behave, but we're only interested in t equals zero. So now they're asking what happens when we very first close the switch, and by definition our formulas uh, have been derived so that that would mean t is equal to zero. Well this becomes one, and so we're going to get those initial values. Now if I go back and look at the circuit here, both of these resistors are going to have the same current. So what I can do is I can take the voltage, divide by the total resistance, the 50 ohms, and it says that we're going to start off with 0 0.400 amps or 400 milliamps. So that's the, um, that's the starting current in this setup. All right, questions on this? Yeah, I've got to go back and get some uh, additions and then correct these numbers here. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions at all, stop by. Let's take a break right now, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll take a look at another set of problems.